Commissioner Heiberger, please stand. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, just a reminder to silence your cell phones if you haven't, and meeting documents are next to Commissioner Kelly. And if you need a listening device, uh, Robert uh, is here to help with that. Uh, this morning, uh, Kirsten Kappemeyer won't be here because he and his wife had a lovely baby girl yesterday, and looks like, Sarah, you're not going to be around too long either. <laughs> no, no, until February you got do you want to investigate what's going on in the state's <laughs> <laughs> With that, we'll go to routine business. Item number one is consider a motion to approve the agenda. So moved. Second. A motion and a second to approve routine business or the, and the agenda, I guess. Those in favor, say aye. 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 Those opposed, motion unanimously passes. Item two is to approve the county commission minutes of December 3rd, 2013. Motion to approve. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve the minutes from 12-3. Those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, nay. Motion unanimously passes. Item three are bills to be paid in the amount of $426,148.61. Pay the bills with a comment. Is there a second? Second. second. We have a motion and a second to approve the bills. Jeff? Mr. Chairman, uh, today we have uh, nearly 280 uh, bills in the area of mental health, and I've invited uh, Scott Peters to come and uh, discuss that for just a moment. Scott, would you like to uh, come forward now for a minute? Uh, they range from $15 to $4,200. <coughs> morning, Scott. Good morning, Commissioners. Scott Peters, Minnehaha County Board of Mental Illness. Actually, it's the Minnehaha Lincoln County Board of Mental Illness because we have a combined board. Um, to date, through November, we've had uh, 1,053 petitions for commitment. 808 of those involve Minnehaha County residents. About 108 involve uh, out of state or out of county residents that Minnehaha County has handled. The remaining uh, petitions, 43 of them are Lincoln County residents and 94 are out of county residents that Lincoln County has handled in uh, in 69th Street of Behavioral Health, and they pay all the expenses for those. But out of the 916 petitions that we had through November, uh, of course, state and federal due process requires that we uh, have a petition for commitment and that we have an evaluation of those petitions within the first 24 hours. We house them at Avera Behavioral Health Center, uh, unless they're full, or at uh, Sanford or McKinnon Hospital if they've had a serious medical issue from an overdose or suicide attempt. And so the, the bills come from those evaluations uh, by a mental health <coughs> professional, their administrative costs of me reviewing petitions and taking reports and deciding dispositions we have occasionally a hearing uh, in Minnehaha County or actually at Behavioral Health, but if we have hearings, most of the time they're on patients that we send out at the Human Services Center. And of course, there's a $600 a month charge for patients at the Human Services Center. So that's largely where the bills come from. The largest bill here, the $4,200 bill, was a seven-day stay of a patient in uh, McKinnon Hospital for medical issues after an overdose. And so they, they range, as Commissioner Barth has said, from $15 <coughs> to $4,200 this time. But I'd be happy to answer questions if you have any. Uh, Commissioner Eiberger? Do you know what the increase has been in percentage over the last few years? I mean, have we been seeing a sharp increase in the last five, six years? In costs or petitions? In petitions. Uh, actually, the number of petitions has gone down with the implementation of the mobile crisis team. Mobile crisis <coughs> excuse me, sees uh, from 30 to 50 patients a, a month, and so on an average of 40, probably they've seen four to 500 patients uh, through November. Uh, our projected number of petitions for this year was uh, 1,500, and so 
1,053 uh, is quite a bit under uh, our projection without mobile crisis. So they've done a good job in diverting um, uh, patients from holds and those collateral costs. Thanks, Scott. Any other questions for Scott? Thank you, Scott, for coming. Thank you, Commissioners. <clears throat> uh, we have a motion and a second to approve the bills as listed. Those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, motion unanimously passes. Item 4 are reports, the Minnehaha County Sheriff's Department report for November 2013 and the Minnehaha County Human Services report for November 2013. They have been received and are placed on file in the auditor's office. Item 5 is personnel. A is to approve the pers uh, routine personnel actions. I'll move those actions. Second. A motion and a second. Uh, good morning, Carrie. Good morning. Before you approve those, we have two individuals who are unable to make it to last year's or last week's meeting. And I would like to invite Tom to introduce his two staff members who are celebrating 20 years of service. We have two of our employees that have been here for 20 years. It's Roger Stansel and John Crittenden. Thank you, uh, Roger and John. We appreciate your service and keeping our community safe this time of year and for all the hard work you do during the rest of the year. So we appreciate your support. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Carrie. We have a motion and a second to approve routine action. Any other questions? Those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, motion unanimously passes. Item B is to authorize the chairman to sign a contract with Siegel Consulting for a Minnehaha County Compensation Study. Carrie Deaver. For the past six weeks, the committee has been reviewing the responses that we've received to the RFP for the compensation study. After, I'd probably say what, to be about six weeks of deliberation and interviews, phone interviews and in, on, or on-site interviews, the committee is recommending the commission consider hiring Siegel Consulting to perform that compensation study. I'm going to tell you up front that they were the highest cost bid that we received. The reason we think that they're the best um, consultant to go with is they had a very strong proposal. They're able to um, complete the project within the three month time frame that we were hopeful that they could do it within. Extensive government experience. They have experience looking at multiple options for um, compensating employees including pay for performance. Very, very comprehensive final report option. But one of the reasons we feel that they're worth that extra cost is because it comes with a database so that we can conduct the study and review market in the future on our own without hiring a consultant. Not that it'll work forever, but it does have the potential to save us some future costs. So with that, we're recommending your approval of the contract that had been reviewed by Kirsten Kapmeyer before you went out on leave um, so that we can move forward with using Siegel Consulting. Do you have any questions for me? Thank you, Kerry. Any questions for Kerry? Make a motion to have the chairman sign an agreement with uh, Siegel Consulting. Second. second. A motion and a second. Uh, and I think, as you well stated, it's not just the cost, the expense of uh, having that database available to us is literally reducing the cost of the of the uh, quote over a period of time, where the other companies who bid did not uh, offer that alternative. So. This literally saves us money over the long range, so that's good. Any other comments? We have a motion and a second to approve the contract. Those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, motion unanimously passes. Item C is consider a motion to approve changes to the Minnehaha County Drug and Alcohol Policy and to adopt the Drug and Alcohol Procedures Manual. Carrie Deaver. Two weeks ago, I provided you with a briefing on changes to our drug and alcohol policy, which, as you'll recall, were minimal. The major changes here is that we've expanded that policy into a procedures manual so that we can expand pre-employment drug testing for all safety-sensitive physicians, where right now we only do it for DOT physicians. That procedure manual outlines what we're going to do for all those pre-employment processes, as well as the random program that we'd like to implement in January as well as how we would do testing for reasonable suspicion for any of our employees. So really it's just there as a guideline to help us make sure that we're applying policies and procedures fairly and consistently. Questions for Kerry? Commissioner Kelly? Kerry, I don't remember if I asked this when we set the... We talked about this once before, I think. That's correct, yep. Does this apply to the volunteers 
in the emergency management? You did ask that question, and unfortunately, no, at this point in time, it's for part-time and full-time employees only. Volunteers aren't considered employees of Minnehaha County. So right now, that policy doesn't take it into consideration. You did ask us to look into that, though, and we will do so. Do you think it would be a good idea? They, they are driving emergency equipment with lights and sirens, and if there's an accident, we got a problem. Yep. Uh, I just wonder why that has been missing in the past. As a government employer, there are certain restrictions that we have in place in, for us that, that limit how much drug and alcohol testing we can do of staff or a public employer. Um, so very honestly, I'm not sure if we're going to have the capability to do so or not, and that's something I'm happy to work with the state's attorney's office and looking into. Could you look into it a little further and see Absolutely. if we have context Absolutely. for the action? Thank you. Any other questions? We have a motion. As we do have a motion. No, we do not. We'll move to we'll approve. Thank you. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve the changes. Those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, motion unanimously passes. Thank you. Thank you. Item number six is application for abatement. Kyle Halseth. Good morning, Commissioners. Kyle Halseth, Director of Equalization. We bring before you this morning one request for abatement of taxes, and this is for the year 2012 from the Christian Reformed Church, record ID 21634. You may question why it was for 2012 in that we waited for approximately 18 months to get a signature on the abatement application. So I apologize for that. Uh, it is in the amount of $2,289.73. Thank you, Kyle. Uh, any questions? Make a motion to approve the abatement. Second. Is there anyone here from the church or not? Why did it take 18 months? God works in mysterious ways. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I've heard of separating the church and state, but that's going a little far. <laughs> um, I think we'll move on. We have a motion and a second to approve the abatement. Those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, the motion unanimously passes. Thank you. Thank you. Item 7 are notices and requests. A is to authorize the county auditor to publish a notice to bidders for Minnehaha County Highway Project MC 50-300-118-1, a bridge and deck rehabilitation on 484th Avenue over Split Rock Creek, approximately 4.5 miles north and 2 miles east of South Dakota Highway 11 and I-90 interchange. Good morning, Tom. Tom Wells again, Highway Department. Um, this is a project that we let once before this year, and the bid was over 20% over the engineer's estimate, and we rejected that bid. The bid letting for this project is scheduled for January 8th. Any other questions? Questions for Tom? Thank you for redoing that. Is there a motion? We'll make the motion. Second. We have a motion and a second to republish the bid. Those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, motion unanimously passes. Item number eight are planning and zoning notices. Item A is to authorize the county auditor to publish a notice of hearing to consider zoning text amendment number 13-05 to allow the keeping of fowl in the rural residential district, article four of the 2002 revised joint zoning ordinance for Minnehaha County and the city of Sioux Falls, Scott Anderson. Thank you, Scott Anderson, Planning and Zoning Director. Uh, today, this I'm bringing a, a request to set a hearing date of January 28, 2014. This would be before the joint city county commission meetings. And uh, just shortly to give you an explanation, uh, we are. This is a request that came in from a citizen uh, in the Split Rock Heights uh, area on the east side of Sioux Falls. Uh, the request is to allow uh, the keeping of fowl, uh, which actually <coughs> is uh, chickens and ducks, and this would be uh, it limited to the rural residential zoning district. 
which if you're not familiar with that zoning district in the county, it is the larger lot sizes. So you would have uh, minimum lot sizes of one acre. And um, the request would be to uh, allow chickens, ducks, whatever, fowl, with a conditional use permit. So it would be reviewed by the Planning Commission and the neighbors would be notified. There'd be public participation. So the first, the first part of the ordinance amendment would be adding um, that conditional use to rural residential, the keeping of fowl. And then secondly, there'd be a proposed uh, new definition for what a fowl is, uh, which I specifically identifies chickens and the like, ducks and the like, and then larger bodied birds like pheasants or quail or whatever and the like. Um, I'd be glad to answer any questions. This has gone to the Planning Commission. Um, as I indicated, it was brought to the staff through uh, a petitioner. So um, I have worked with that petitioner. We work closely, the departments work closely with the state's attorney um, and uh, the state's attorney's office. So I'd be glad to answer any questions, but uh, this would be setting the hearing date for the public hearing um, January 28th. Thank you, Scott. Does anyone have any questions? <coughs> was there any <coughs> Mr. Kelly? Was there any opposition at the uh, planning commission? No, there was no opposition. And I should indicate that we're allowing up to six of these <coughs> fowl. So you don't get an unlimited amount. It would be six. And that was, it's similar. The city's already gone through this. If you recall, about a year ago, they adopted their chicken and whatnot in the city. And um, this, uh, tries to accommodate a similar use and actually it, it's probably going to work better for the county because this or better, better for us because it would go into a zoning district where you have an acre so you should have plenty of room for five or six chickens to run around and I have prepared the or the ordinance the hearing notice and the fact of adoption I've submitted that to the auditor's office so it's all ready to go any other questions if not, uh, is there a motion to publish? So moved. Second. Uh, we have a motion and a second to publish a notice of hearing for January 28th. Those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, motion unanimously passes. There are no petition for compromise of lien today. The next item is an opportunity for public comment. Anyone who would like to come forward and speak about something who, that is not on the agenda, we'd like to hear from them now. Uh, no one's coming forward, so we'll go to item 10. Item 10 is a hearing to conduct drainage permit, to consider drainage permit application number 13-75, submitted by Chris Heavey to conduct agricultural draining in the Northwest Quarter Section 13, Township 104 North, Range 52 West. Scott Anderson. Thank you. Uh, once again, Scott Anderson representing the Planning Zoning Department. <coughs> Today you have a drainage permit application request 1375 as Cindy indicated was submitted by Chris Heavey. Um, the property is located in Buffalo Township in um, section 13 and I have a slide presentation. I'll just go over the, uh, some of the facts with you before I go over the slides. Um, this, was, this item is coming to you as one of the downstream property owners, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife would not sign the a waiver request to do the agricultural tiling. Uh, I sent out hearing notices to all of the downstream property owners for at least a half mile downstream and there were four of them. I sent those notices out two weeks ago as is required by our drainage ordinance. Uh, I have not heard anything from any of the affected property owners and today is the day of the hearing. So I will show you um, the uh, I'm going to toggle back and forth between these two maps so you get an idea of what, what's going on. Uh, the property in yellow is the, is the subject property, and you can see that little dimple that looks like a smile. That's where the tiling is going to occur, and if you notice, it's going to cross the road, which is 456th Avenue. It's going to cross property owned by Clifford and Lori Gardner, and they have signed the, the uh, downstream waiver. And then it crosses into property uh, that is owned by U.S. Fish and Wildlife, and it empties into this small, unnamed lake or a very large slough, whichever your preference is. But 
I did look on the U.S. Topo maps, and it's not named. It's not a named lake. It's just a, a rather good-sized lake. Um, the the uh, the proposed tile outlet it outlets in one spot, which is in uh, section 14, <coughs> and the applicant did provide the uh, the wetland determinations and it has been determined that this is a prior converted um, wetland for crops so uh, so I'll go back again we'll toggle back you can see the area that is uh, wet and the applicant wants to tile that here's again where the um, direction of the of the tile is going to go and I'll show you some pictures this is the tile looking back to the uh, sort of East, southeast, you can see the little blue flags. I, I, they were out there. I assume that sort of follows where the proposed tile line is going to go. This is the field, part of the field that's going to be tiled. This shows you sort of the lake that it empties into. You can see it's a, a wildlife area. It was posted. It's a rather good size, a small lake, a good size slough. This shows, once again, the area as it sort of uh, slopes off to the northwest. And once again, you can see that wet area. You can see, if you look closely, some more blue flags. And those are the pictures. Uh, the crops were out. It's not a large area that's being tiled. Uh, our recommendation, I'll get back to the, this slide. Uh, our recommendation is that the proposed tile line uh, is going to be in an area, a wet area, that has fu and functions as part of the, all of the same watershed. And staff is recommending that the drainage board that the drainage board approves drainage permit 1375. I'd be glad to answer any questions you have. And the applicant, Mr. Heavey, is here if you have questions for him. Uh, Commissioner <coughs> Barth, Scott, uh, how does it go under the highway there or under the road? I mean, they'll put in a they'll put in a tile, a solid um, pipe or a, a vented pipe, or I assume a solid pipe. But you, you may want to ask the applicant that. And he'll have to work with the township to, to get that approval. Any other questions for Scott? Chris, would you like to come forward and say anything? Or? Yes, I can. You'll need to identify yourself and give us your address, please. Um, Chris Heavey, 24555, 466th Avenue, Colton, South Dakota. Uh, one thing that I would like to point out that um, the outlet, there is an existing tile there that runs from my property west through Gardner's property and does outlet now at the Game Fish and Parks land. Um, it just isn't working. I want to add to it and it's not working. So that part, the actual, there is a tile that does run in there. Um, one thing, the blue flags that he uh, referenced, they were, I tore some trees down there. That was a one call day. That had nothing to do with the tiling. So okay. That was just the water line mark. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> so. Thank you, Chris. Anyone else have any questions for Chris? Doesn't appear so. Uh, because this is a public hearing, is there anyone who is op in opposition to the application? I don't see anyone moving forward. Uh, is there a motion from the uh, commission? Move to approve the drainage permit. Second. second. We have a motion and a second to approve the drainage permit application 13-75. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, <coughs> motion unanimously passes. Good luck. Item number 11 is consider a motion to approve a final change order in the amount of a negative $7,118.11 to the contract for project MC50-150-202-2 bridge superstructure replacement on Minnehaha County Highway 139, the T. Ellis Road, Tom Wilsey. Yes, this is a, to adjust our final as-built quantities on the project. Um, all the items that are listed here were field measured or added or deleted as needed for the construction. The construction was handled by HDR and did a, they did a very good job for us. Any questions? 
Thank you. Is there any questions for Tom? If not, is there a motion? Motion to approve. Second. Motion and a second to adjust the contract by $7,118.11 reduction. Those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, motion unanimously passes. Item number 12 is to authorize the chairman to sign professional services agreement for final design services with JSA Engineering and Land Surveyors in the amount of $14,968 to replace bridge structures 50-290-131 and 50-290-135 located on 483rd Avenue north of Brandon. Shannon Schultz. Good morning, Commissioner. Shannon Schultz, Minneapolis County Highway Department, Senior Project Engineer. The item before you is requests to, re, uh, to go forward with final design on, on one of the two bridges. These bridges are in very close proximity to each other. Uh, they're both relatively uh, posted at the same reduction. However, uh, through the TSNL process, type, size, and location study, and that's why we do these, uh, we determined that the replacement of the northern structure, which is structure number 295-131, this is the north structure over Split Rock, uh, the cost to replace that would be $500,000. And because of its context and basically very, very low volume of, of traffic, probably on the order of 40, and probably 35 of those happen on Sunday when, the, when they use that route for church. So the route is very little used. There's no adjacent residences. There's pasture and cropland on both sides. So it's really just a gravel road out in the country, not serving any residences. So. It's our recommendation and our also uh, preferred <coughs> plan to, to not address 295-131 at this time. We will just continue to let that re use out its remaining service life. Uh, the second structure, which is the one we we're requesting approval to go forward with final design, is a tributary to Split Rock Creek, also known as structure 50-29-135. It is south of the, exist or the structure I just mentioned. And uh, again, Due to the context, we are not, we're proposing to not replace it with a full-blown bridge. We're going to we'll probably go forward with a low water crossing, which is exactly how it functions now. Uh, the bridge is located uh, slightly south of the existing low water crossing, which is just a sag in the road. When the, when the upstream waters flood, they cross the road at that sag, and that's how that particular um, creek migrates downstream. So we're proposing to perpetuate that in a formal way and uh, add a slight cost savings to the county, you know, to, to, to build it uh, with a full-blown bridge would cost somewhere around $350,000, but with our proposed three 36-inch round concrete pipes uh, costing around 175000 that would also include uh, some concrete road where the water crossing is. And I guess we're kind of doing this as a constellation with the township. We don't want to make Every time it's going to, you know, cross the road, we don't want them to have to go out and repair that road as it washes out, which is what they have to do now. Mm -hmm. So that's what we're proposing. Thank you, Shannon. Uh, does anyone have any questions for Shannon? Commissioner Eiberger? Um, just the way it's listed on our agenda, I think that we'll need to change the motion because it says replace bridge, bridge structures, and it's got the two numbers, and we won't be replacing that 131 and also won't re be replacing the bridge 135 will be changing that to a low water crossing so I think we need to make sure that when we make the motion we correct our what's listed on our agenda okay. thank you is that a motion I can make that as a motion I'll second thank you Jeff has a commissioner I no, our birth. <laughs> <laughs> um, Shannon on the on the existing bridge is there a railing and stuff and when we replace it with these culverts there's we'll some railing I wouldn't lean against it uh, the bridge on the south side is built in 1937, so the railing is really more of uh, a facade. Uh, and the, the, the northern structure does have some standard railing. Tom might know on the left. Uh, I have a picture of that bridge in my mind. It's a larger structure, uh, so uh, there is going to be more function on the north bridge because it is a major tributary. Tom, do you know if the north structure has railing on it or not? It has some. <laughs> They've come through with enough farm equipment. That Tom, you might have to come to the mic, please. <laughs> there is some railing on both of these structures. There's been enough large farm equipment come through that it's been damaged severely. Okay. Thank you. 
Any other questions? If not, we have a motion and a second to approve the uh, professional service agreement and it is not to replace the bridge but to use the described low flow culvert. Any other questions? Those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, <coughs> motion unanimously passes. Thanks, Shannon. Item number 13 is consider a motion to supplement $7,411.80 to ASN 1564 instead of ASN 15691 in the state's attorney's budget to cover the cost of equipment to help in trial preparation. The original supplement was passed in June of 2013. Bob Good morning, Commissioners. The request uh, for this action came down from the state's attorney's office, and they uh, apparently have found a more suitable ASN, and uh, they're the ones making this request. Anyone have any questions of Bob? If not, is there a motion? To move. Second. A motion and a second to approve the uh, change in the ASN for $7,411.88. Those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, <coughs> motion unanimously passes. Thank you. Item 14 is consider authorization for the following items related to the purchase of e-poll books. A is consider a resolution to declare Minnehaha County as a single voting precinct. B is to authorize the county chairman to purchase e-poll books with payment method decided by the county commission. And item C is to authorize the auditor, deputy state's attorney, and chairman to oversee contract preparation. Bob Litz. Good morning again, Commission Bob Litz from the auditor's office. and. Uh, uh, while I realize that uh, uh, this is uh, quite a, a, a large document that uh, we're, I'm, I'm still got to go over it because I think the public uh, uh, deserves to have the details of this here. And so I'm going to uh, start here with, the, with my, uh, my request here. Uh, the beginnings of the new election cycle starts at the end of this year. Among the many preparations we will need to accomplish is preparations for the four elections we will be involved with this year. The first election that we'll be involved with will be the City of Sioux Falls Joint Municipal School Board on April 8, 2014. Uh, the second one will be the possible secondary municipal election on April 29th. And our involvement uh, as a county with this will be our usual absentee voting and counting of the ballots the night of that election. Uh, the county's actual election, the first one will be the primary election on June 3rd, 2014, and the general election on November 4th, 2014. Any no, I'd like to just stop every it's now and then because this is a long document. Actually, if there's any questions that I can answer about the subject matter we just covered. Any questions of Bob so far? Uh, Commissioner Barth? Bob, what does it mean to be a single precinct? Uh, a single precinct is, is the, the way the state law reads right now is that in order for us to do the election centers where anybody can vote anywhere, uh, the commission has to designate uh, the whole county as a single precinct. Any other questions? It just doesn't work for me, but then, okay. I'll uh, just, I guess, uh, input a little bit here. The e poll books are not voting machines, they are registration. Uh, I've had that question before in this morning's conversation and some others that uh, they think that people are voting electronically, they are not voting yeah. electronically. That's correct, Commissioner. Actually, downstairs, you know, if you go in for absentee voting, we have a computer that we pull up your, uh, your information on. And in a sense, it's a, it's a, a precursor to the e-poll books that, uh, we're ask, uh, that I'm asking for today. Uh, first part here, the city and school elections 2014. Earlier this year, the city, school district, and the county agreed upon standardizing election locations. And I, I want to emphasize this is within the city limits. Uh, the group settled on 13 locations, and the city had an ADA consultant that toured the sites uh, with us to assure access was acceptable. Uh, we also considered parking lot access, entry to the building, and once inside a site, immediacy of the actual polling booths and tables and electrical outlets. Connect connectivity is not a problem at these locations. Uh, the city and the school district are, are doing the e-poll book and election center concepts going forward. Uh, the 13 sites work for the city elections, school elections, and would certainly work for a primary election. Any, are there any questions about that portion of my 
presentation. Commissioner Heiberger. Did the city of Sioux Falls buy EPO books? Uh, no, they're, uh, they can, uh, they, what they would like to do is lease them from the county. And uh, we've not agreed upon any terms yet because we don't know the total cost at this point. Uh, Secretary of State would also have some uh, uh, should uh, the commission decide not to go this route today. So they, they do have an option. You talk about, excuse me, mm -hmm. does anyone else have any questions? Connectivity, who did we internally do that or was that done by outside agencies to uh, make well, sure they were connected? The, the buildings that, uh, that are there, uh, by and large, were already involved with the poll book elections. Uh, there's a couple of new ones there, and I guess I would have to have the city and Bev, uh, or, you know, Bev from the school district. She's here today uh, for any questions you might have. And Lori uh, uh, was busy, but she wanted to be here but could not do that. Uh, the connectivity in the city uh, is, is pretty much a given. Uh, you might have a space within a building that you could have trouble at, but the the, uh, the MiFi card that you have can be moved, uh, and, and Monty might correct me on this, but I believe the distance is 30 feet away from the e-poll book to put it in a window or a door space to improve that connectivity. Uh, and I would, have, I, would, I would tell you more about that uh, further in my presentation, okay. Commissioner. Thank you. Okay. County elections 2014. The county elections would also need 12 additional sites for up-county voting with e-poll book vote center concept in both the general and primary elections. And by what I mean by up county is if you look at any map, north is up, and generally it's the, the northern flung, northern flung uh, voting locations uh, that, uh, that I'm talking about. And basically, uh, for those locations, what I, th what I feel is that uh, if we keep those locations that we've used as precincts, we standardize the, the locations and, and nobody has to change up their driving distances because I think out in the county uh, it turns into a driving, it turns into geography and how many miles you drive and if we don't interrupt that cycle I don't think anybody's going to be upset about it and I think that the access is fairly spread out uh, throughout the county if we use the old precincts as election centers. Uh, all the former precincts out in the county would be active. The county may add some more sites inside the city for the general election. We want to review after the city school election returns to get a clearer picture of turnouts and where additional city sites might be desirable. The monitoring of the city school election and our primary would hopefully reveal any improvements that we would desire as we progress. Now, uh, by, by checking them out, what, 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 what I would be looking for is the intensity of the voter turnout at a location. And, and let's say Memorial School just got uh, some really great numbers for voter turnout during the school election. I may consider having another uh, election center that's close by to take some of the overflow or some of the pressure off of that, uh, that location. The other thing that the city helped uh, out with before that uh, I was gathering some information was the last time, I think it was for the, the uh, event center election, what we did was we monitored uh, the street traffic at certain times at certain locations. Uh, because it is my firm belief that um, if, if we're dumping a bunch of more traffic on a school location when the kids are getting out and people are going home from work, I don't think we're doing anybody a service. So uh, I would be mindful of that uh, situation coming up during the election as well. And we would try to mitigate any uh, of those types of situations during the general election where, of course, the turnout is much larger. Uh, is there any questions on that portion? Very good. Uh, counties with or considering e-poll book uh, election centers, uh, the following counties have made the change to e-poll books and election centers so far, Hyde, Potter, uh, Sully, and Yankton County. And the following counties are pursuing e-poll book election centers for their next election cycle. Uh, Hughes County, Brookings County, and they did their last election with e-poll books, uh, Brown County, Davison County, Coddington County, and Pennington County. And she has the e-poll books in her possession. However, I would tell you that due to geography, she is going to use the e-poll books, but not the election center concept. She's still going to stay with the precincts uh, because she has she can drive up to 100 miles, and uh, so uh, her concern was if if they had ballots that they had to take out there, getting them there in time. Now that said, uh, the e-poll books do have a ballot counting feature, so you can, as the ballots go out, you can you can find out how many of the certain ballots you have left at a certain time. Are there any questions about any of the other counties? Commissioner Iberger. Just a point to make that I think you just made was that at each 
voting center, they will have to have every ballot for every area of the county. That is correct. And, uh, you know, I've investigated that, and 115% uh, of the uh, registered voter seems to be the sweet spot for this type of an election. So last time I made 100% of the ballots, we had, a, we had some left over, uh, but the, uh, the people who have done this before advise going to 115%. So if I uh, take those numbers from the last election, that would be about an extra $1,200 in ballots. Other questions? Commissioner Barth? Um, Bob, have they done this uh, system in other states with larger populations? I mean, certainly, you know, I went down and watched them in Yankton uh, use this, and I was, uh, it, it looked pretty good to me, but they are only one legislative district. So, you know, have they used them in Cook County or in uh, Hennepin County or? The, the ones that uh, Hart uh, talked to me about were down in Texas and Colorado. And uh, the one place in Texas where I believe it's around Galveston has 215 precincts, and they rolled those out. Uh, they also, that was one of the uh, people that uh, uh, was giving me a number for a reference. I called them up and, and they, they really liked the poll books and, and had minimal trouble with them and met 215 precincts. Last time, for comparison purposes, Minnehaha County, we had 71 precincts. Other questions at this point? Okay, uh, I'd like to move on to connectivity. Last summer, the auditor's office conducted connectivity testing in the county rural precincts. Early this spring, we plan to re-examine the sites of the old precincts to make sure we have connectivity going forward. And when I went out in the county uh, to the precinct places, uh, I was a little bit ignorant. I took the MiFi card and I went out there, and some of the places like Colton comes to come to my mind. Uh, they have a large metal building that they. Uh, they do their elections in, and I was inside the metal building about 30 feet away from the 40 feet away from the door where they actually have the table for voting. I did not know at that time you could move that MiFi up to the window or the door to get better connectivity. Uh, some of my places out there had excellent connectivity, and then other ones had questionable connectivity because of this situation. Uh, concerns have been aired about field techs available for the initial deployment of e-poll books. We will have representatives of the Secretary of State's office available to us. The vendor of the e-poll books, Hart Inner Civic, will be in the state and have representatives available. Election school that I will be putting on will have an additional segment on e-poll books twice this year, once for the primary and again for the general election. The e-poll book will be set up in those classes. The potential for help from uh, the SETI computer classes uh, is being explored. The election center superintendents will be required to set up and test the day before the election. And that's real common. They, they, most of them did that anyway. Uh, but I'm hoping that uh, that will reveal 99% uh, of any problems that we might have the night before. Uh, I have also two uh, troubleshooters, Marty DeWitt and Joe Morrison, that are experienced in elections and know all the precincts. They're also tech savvy. I have also have an ex-employee from the Secretary of State's office. Andrew Petrus, who will be assisting Minnehaha County this election cycle, and he was present for the first e-poll book rollouts in the state and is currently employed by the city of Harrisburg. Uh, the responsibility division of tasks that was agreed upon, and that is attached. Uh, it's on the back with the other documents of the letters from the city and the school. Uh, I could also contract with an outside provider to help with the MiFi Verizon piece. And the e the e-poll books keep track of the styles and quantity of ballots at location, and there is a connectivity indicator light showing on the e-poll books. Uh, also, since I did this document, uh, uh, Monty and I had a, a few conversations about this here, and, and of course the uh, IT department is, 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 is really busy, uh, and, and his ability to loan me some of his people at any time during a selection is, is curtailed. Uh, and so to that end, I've contacted two providers in town here. One of them would be Elbow Computing, and I talked with Kevin Elsling, Elsing, E-L-S-I-N-G. They're very interested in it. Uh, and then another uh, uh, person that uh, I contacted was On-Site Technical Service, and that's Todd Bourne, and he also is interested in exploring this possibility. Um, can I answer anything about connectivity segment in my presentation at this point? Commissioner Heiberger? So you're talking contracting outside IT workers to do the loading of all the e-poll books before and after 
No, the loading of the EPOL books will be between Hart uh, InterCivic, who is the vendor of the EPOL books, and the Secretary of State's office. So, who? What would you be using outside IT support? You know, the for? day of, the, like, like I said, the, we'll, I'll send my superintendents out, and they'll set up the day before. And if we have any issues right then, we're hoping that the red lights all come on and show connectivity. And if there's not, then we send somebody out. And then the day of the election, if we have any technical problems, that day we'll have people on standby that are experienced in. Uh, on-site or, or, or remote monitoring or actually going to the place. Now, I would tell you this, that all the details of that aren't worked out, uh, and the reason for that is I really don't know after the school election how many more precincts I'm going to have, so the numbers are a little bit iffy, uh, but as, as we go farther down my contract, or my, in my, my presentation, you'll find out that uh, I've got... Uh, I'm asking that Gerald Benega, Kirsten Kapmeyer, or perhaps whoever's sitting in that chair and myself uh, move forward with the details on these as they reveal themselves. There are some things that are unknowable today, uh, in spite of the best research I can do. How many, uh, Bob, how many people do the uh, two contractors that you mentioned have on staff to be able to do this? Because one of those individuals I know is a single person with other functions so Todd is but he mentioned that he could contract with us up to five extra people that day and elbow computing indicated they had three people okay, okay security concerns uh, there were security concerns about the e-poll books and I, I believe they've been nullified there are no security breaches that could affect the county IT system from the use of e-poll books they're singular purpose and unable to connect to the internet by users voter registration is downloaded by the state that information would be the same whether it's on paper vote or whether it's on a paper voter registration book or an electronic uh, poll book. Any questions about security concerns? Commissioner Barth. So having outside contractors work uh, basically on the brains of our uh, voter registration list is not is not a concern. I don't believe it is because we would be looking at uh, the mechanical aspects of plugging things in, getting it running. They're not going to be involved with the downloading of that information. And Mr. Chairman, I'm a little bit teasing on this, but I remember in the last election that uh, one of Mitt Romney's sons is an investor in, in Heart Interactive on this. And, you know, I mean, people just think, you know, is there, is there a concern here somewhere where there could be a problem? Well, you know, the commissioner to that end, I would say there's a lot of people's investments in a lot of companies all over the United States, and you're never going to get away from that perception of uh, conflict of interest. I mean, that's, that's uh, just about impossible in today's world. Other questions at this point? May I move on? Sure. Very good. Have a funds and costs. The cost of the e-poll book kit is approximately $2,000 per unit. It is determined that 100 of the e-poll books are needed for Minnehaha County. That is just under $200,000 plus an annual licensing fee of $6,000. The purchase could be covered by HAVA funds, which we today we have $660,748.64. The purchase would still leave enough for the ballot tabulation machines uh, scheduled for that we've talked about in 2018. A contract for the county person, uh, county's purchase would need to be drawn up by the state's attorney's office. The city and the county would like to lease our e-poll books. That cost to be determined and revisions to the city and school election agreements are still pending. Any questions about HAVA? I have, Mr. Oh, Chair, go ahead, Jeff. If we don't spend the money, uh, does that uh, roll over, so to speak? Do we get to keep that HAVA fund? Uh, reserved for Minnehaha County to, to the Ab future? Absolutely, Commissioner. And, you know, we even get a little bit of uh, interest on it here now. You know, in days gone by, Sue did pretty good. She would get uh, $30,000, $35,000 worth of interest on here, and it was enough to pay for segments of the election, uh, which was real nice. But uh, as we all know, the investing climate is not that today. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to talk about the three viable options of paying for well, the machines. Bob, just a question. The county would purchase the, bo <coughs> the books. And the city and the county would like to lease our books. The city and school district? That's correct. Thank you. Yeah, I have a typo in there, I guess. There are three viable options of paying for the machines. Number one would be to draw the funds out of the general fund, and the county pays directly to the vendor. Number two would be to draw the funds from the general fund and submit application for reimbursement from the HAVA funds that the county has and are administered by the state. 
Third option would be to have the Secretary of State purchase the machines with state HAVA funds and reimburse the state with county HAVA funds. In the past, there were two times per year a county could apply for reimbursement for HAVA funds. The change in administrative rules changed the time frame from, to, from that to any time during the year. It usually takes about four weeks from application to disbursement. The Division of Responsibilities worksheet shows the breakdown of deployment roles. There are letters of support from the school district and the city of Sioux Falls election officials. The common use of e-poll books and election centers will simplify the voter experience and cause less confusion because of uniformity. The questions about uh, methods of payment. Commissioner Heiberger. Uh, the HAVA funds, we're also planning on using those funds for future tabulation machine replacement, That's correct? correct. And you know, with uh, us buying 100 of them, 200, uh, and then 200, assuming that it's 200 or uh, 250 thousand dollars, we'd still have half a fund money left over after buying the e-poll books and the tabulation machines. And one more question. Did you say? Did you say earlier that if the county didn't buy them, that the city could rent them from the state? That uh, you know, and I, I don't want to speak on behalf of the state, but that has uh, been the pattern of what's happened before. There's a precedent. On one more question. Sure. Would the state rent them to us? That's uh, something I did not explore. I don't believe they have enough of them at the current time. Other questions? Commissioner Peckis? Why do we have to go to one precinct? Uh, that is something the Secretary of State has determined in statute we have to do in order to uh, conduct the election centers. Go from a bunch of precincts to one precinct. And uh, Mr. Peckis, as you well know, I'm no attorney, but uh, I imagine there's a good reason for it. I have no idea. Well, you know, to that end, uh, you know, uh, every at, at the end of every census, uh, you commissioners redefine uh, what the precincts are. Right. Uh, and so I think it's along the lines of that thought that uh, we're, if we're going to change something to do with the precincts, that the commission has to do that. We're going from many precincts to one precinct. One big precinct. One big precinct. The whole county would become a precinct. Commissioner so Kelly, in, I'm sorry. So if I lived in Sioux Falls, I could go all the way up to Colt and vote in the Sioux Falls election. That's correct. Commissioner Kelly. So what's the bad part of going to a single precinct? There must be some negatives to that. None? Well, I don't know. I don't know there is. Well, we, I think we need to know... We need to know, you know, uh, other factors. Well, you know, you're assuming there is something bad about it, and I'm not certain. There is. No, I'm not assuming that. I'm just saying that is there any is there any fallout? And you said you didn't know. You know, uh, one thing that did come to uh, uh, my attention the other day with Bev, uh, and we were having some conversations, and one of her precincts, uh, her one of her election centers, opened up uh, 15 minutes late, and they all had to because of the way the state law was. So they all stayed open 15 minutes after the election was over because uh, they are a single precinct. Now, she, she would like some changes in the state statute, approached the Secretary of State about that. Uh, he feels that uh, th that is not the answer, and I don't know what he's got in mind, but uh, that was one, one thing that could be a possibility. Commissioner Iver. What if we have an issue with connectability at one of our precincts in the rural county, and then you've got people standing there, or they can't vote there for two hours as a as the connectability is down? Does that affect that? Does that affect when that particular precinct closes yes. at the end of the election? Yes. So connectability is a huge factor in this whole entire process. That's correct. And so, you know, to that end, uh, we go do the MiFi checks to make sure we have connectivity to begin with. And then the night before, when the election superintendent set up, we check the connectivity. And then the morning of the election, we check the connectivity. You ever heard of Murphy? Oh, I know him well. <laughs> <laughs> but even in the county building, we at time have all of our computer systems will go down for a period of time. So their connectability could just, like you said, Murphy's Law, go down. <clears throat> Mr. Barr. Well, when I was down observing in Yankton, uh, there was one precinct, uh, one precinct, one voting location that opened late because uh, the sheriff's deputies who were transporting the machines out there stopped for a donut someplace <laughs> on the way and didn't have the urgency to get those machines out there. Um, that said, apparently it was also a, 
a, a cafe of some kind where that was at, and they gave free food to the voters who were waiting uh, to vote. It was kind of a nice deal that way. But there, certainly there, there was a glitch. I mean, potentially you'd have a blizzard going on, and uh, trying to deliver those machines could be uh, challenging. Commissioner Kelly. Back in the signal precinct, will the whole Minnehaha County be precinct 1-1 one, one then? Is that, and there, there won't be a 3-5 or a... That's correct. Well, that's that's one of the questions I've got. Because yeah. our legislative districts follow our precincts. So <clears throat> how are we going to differentiate between the different legislative districts? That, and that has to do with who gets what ballot. And uh, the, uh, the e-poll book will read that out. You'll get a little receipt that will give the ballot number. And uh, you'll sign that receipt instead of the, the, the poll book. And uh, the election worker will hand you the correct ballot. How, do the, how does the public find out who they're voting for? Well, I would, I would just have to tell you the same Reed way yard they always, signs? they always, yeah, well, yes, yes, the legislative <laughs> districts, yes. Because um, right now, if you go to the paper, you can see where your district is, and you're going to be able to know which district you're in. We can still break out the legislative districts easily. Well, I, I'm not concerned about that. What I'm, my concern is, we can do that here. We're in the know. We're on the inside. I'm asking about Jack Public. How do they find it out? Well, uh, last year I, I did, uh, you know, the Argus Leader, of course, publishes that information on a regular basis. Uh, the county website, I believe, had that information. I also did something that my predecessor didn't do, and it's kind of a gamble, but I spent uh, twelve or $1,500 putting that map in the shopping news. And I don't know how to gauge the response or uh, for something, you know, how effective that advertising is, but we would certainly reach out, as we have in the previous elections, to get that information out to the public. Mr. Chair, yes. Were you here the last time we did the election center? Were you were you the auditor at the time? Uh, yes, I was. Yes, and and to that end, uh, uh, what I did was I had five places that we tried out, and Hart Inner Civic uh, came up here with three people, and and we just tested those five, and we still uh, we just simply didn't have any trouble. Of course, uh, in fairness uh, to that, I had three Hart people here, <laughs> in, in five locations, so you know, we were. We would have been quick to cover any trouble. We didn't I'm, have any I'm sorry, Bob. You're talking about using the e poll books, correct? Yes. See, I'm talking about when we use large election centers. Were you here when we did that for, I think it was for the school board? Well, I think, uh, I think we, they, the city did it for uh, the election center, or I mean the event center, and uh, I think the school has done it twice now. And, and you know, I, I wouldn't want to speak on behalf of Bev uh, here, you know, but I think the school has done it twice now. Uh, once with ES and S, and another time for for with Hart. Well, I, Bev, do you want to address it? E either that, or she's sending me signals that aren't appropriate. <laughs> <laughs> we did we did our 2011 school district election. With, that was the pilot for the state, and that was done with the 10 election centers. Yeah. And then 2011, uh, 2012, we did it with the city, and we had uh, 13 election centers for that and we are planning to do it again in April in 2013 we did it for the school board election and we had the 13 agreed upon uh, election centers that the uh, city and the county and the school district agreed upon okay so we've done it three times John. Bev, do you recall the first time we did this that there seemed to be some confusion on where people were going to vote um, there was, um, we put maps up at all the unused polling sites. We put posters on the doors that voters normally come in to let them know the sites that they could go vote at. Do you think that in your opinion, and I'll ask Bob this too, do you think in your opinion that for a primary and for a general election that the people of Sioux Falls and Minneapolis County are ready to go for these election centers as opposed to the precincts? I will tell you this. We surveyed um, for two elections. We surveyed the voters who voted, and 82% of them loved it. All right. Thank you, Bob. <clears throat> Any other questions? Commissioner Eiberger? Yes, Mr. Bob, if there's a recount, in one area, you have to do the whole entire precinct. So you have to do the whole city in order to do a or city, whole, county. Whole, whole county in order to do a recount yes. on yes, anything. Yes, that is that so is that's one a of the big deal. Yeah. That's time. Mm -hmm. well, 
That's a lot of time. I think that was first. Yeah. Um, have this, has this single precinct thing ever been discussed before us before? Is this the first time we're hearing about it? I don't believe so. I think it's been mentioned, but maybe uh, in the newness of everything else, uh, it, was, it was overlooked or minimized. I don't but, know. Okay, and for instance, I'd ask a question. Both the Democrat and Republican parties have precinct committee men and committee women. Is there only going to be two from each party? Hmm, that's a good question. I don't know if we've done the research on It'll this. make the convention a lot easier. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Commissioner Barth. Um, to John's point about how do people know where to vote, I mean, or who to vote for, certainly in District 14, you know, where we have candidates, uh, Deb Soholt, Mark Feinstein, and Ann Hayek, they're going to have to have their signs up in Del Rapids, just like we county commissioners do, just like Dennis Dugard has to, uh, if that's the way that people figure out who their candidates are. And uh, it, it would be... Uh, incumbent on those voters to uh, and if we do have just one precinct I can still be chairman of the county Democrats you'd also be a precinct <laughs> committeeman yeah I, I could tell you that the Republican Party is very active in filling those slots and the Democrat Party has no but my question is if you don't have precincts how do you have precinct committee people I, don't know. <coughs> I mean I'll be a resident of I don't think I think I'm three five now I'll be a resident of 1-1. One, one. No, I, I, how did they, how did they approach, you know, you talked to the Secretary of State, how does Secretary Gantt approach the issue of gerrymandering and other issues that one precinct would, you know, now, now we're going to say from 33rd to 85th Street is going to be District 14. I mean, instead of being Precinct two one two five, thirteen five. I, I guess I guess the concern I have is how do you get that information out to the public? Well, the legislative districts will not change. That's they'll be the ones that we decided, you know, that you approved in the, after the the census in in twenty ten. Uh, you know, there has been. Uh, in the past, uh, from what I've seen, that Sue has divided those precincts, but uh, you know, due to growth and stuff. But I don't; they were still within that legislative district. The legislative districts will stay the same. Okay, so the the voting precincts are now being divorced from our legislative districts, in the precincts. Okay. You brought up that point uh, when you talk about census. How is that going to affect the district, the legislative districts? If you got one precinct, the legis th that has to do with where you live, and you will be given that ballot for that person that's peculiar to that legislative district. But and it has no effect on the census. On the census, I, I, I don't understand. Well, the some question. of the distribution of dollars is based on where the population is. I, I guess I don't understand the question in relation. I think to I understand your question. You are. Yeah. When the census comes out and they're trying to figure out the size of particular legislative districts for right. you know, redrawing the boundaries, I think they do take a look at those existing precincts and where the population numbers are in order to adjust those legislative districts during the census. I think that's the question that you're getting at. You know, you know, to that end, you know, you were what District 13? Mm -hmm. You know. District 13 forever stopped at 57th Street, and now it goes all the way down to 85th Street, or whatever it is, way down the line of the county. And it yep. goes way yeah. south. So, you know, you have to be pretty much uh, looking at those maps, or at least trying to figure out where your area is if you want to vote in an election. And I think it's, uh, you know, the state's really going to have to pick up the ball and be really proactive on getting that information out. Because at this point, I had a tough time in the last election trying to figure out where the district stops and where, which, where, where the maps are. Because quite honestly, their maps are atrocious. It's like reading a tourism map. <laughs> and uh, you know, I'm, you know, that that's just a, a concern I have. 
And, and to that to that end, uh, Commissioner, that was one of the first duties I had when I, I, I became uh, the, the auditor here was these the legislative districts that were drawn. Yeah, they were draw. They were they were. It was a paragraph full of numbers, and we had to interpret that and figure out where the where the street splits were and uh, put that on a map in Sioux Falls. And that was one of the first things that I did. And uh, there was actually a couple of little uh, blurbs in there that we worked with to get it kind of like you call gerrymandering. There these strange little shapes where they reach down to catch a pocket of people, and uh, you know, population-wise, the numbers are supposed to drive it. Right. Uh, and and. You know those those things every ten years they will shift anyway, and then we also remember that we're Minnehaha County, and and part of those legislative districts may uh, go into Lincoln County, but that's Lincoln County's uh, affair down there, and so we we just the, you know the uh, I guess you know it's always been an issue as to where some people vote, uh, you know the precincts. Yeah, that and, you just open up another can of worms because now we got we got District 13, and that goes into Lincoln County. And that they're still having the precincts down there, but we'll be one precinct up here. So how are you going to be able, if you have to have a recount up here, to be able to differentiate between just the votes from District 13 and the precincts down in Lincoln County that are going to be counted? Because they're not one, are they? No, they're not. Okay. Well, and if, if I may. Sure. Uh, you know, if I lived in District 13, Lincoln County, and I wanted to vote in Hartford, I'm shocked I can't vote. Because I'm from Lincoln County, but everyone else in District 13 or whatever thinks that they can. I do think that this plan has some promise. At the same time, I think there are a Questions. lot of issues. <coughs> Commissioner well, Kelly, the devil's in the detail, obviously, but it begs another question, which John started. Let Lincoln County is still going to be precincts. Uh, we can only affect things to 57th Street, and yet the. The people out there are going to have a whole. When you got a crossover, crossover district like 13 or the one out west, which goes down to T in that area, mm -hmm. uh, to me it Confuse really confuses the whole issue. But you've always had that 57th Street division line for license plates, property taxes, and everything else. I, I right. I'm not but, a, but for the city election, they'll be in the school district. There'll be one election center. But when it comes to a general election, they'll still be going back to precincts or primary. They'll be back to precincts, at least in Lincoln County. And if you combine city and if you if the city has an issue on the general election ballot, when we got an issue also or in the primary, um, you got two different kinds of systems. Well, if you're if you're from Lincoln County, you simply won't show up in our poll books. So you can't vote at our location. We'll send you back down to Lincoln County, and that's a common occurrence today. You know, see, that's that's what I'm talking about, Bob. I got a problem with with sending mixed messages out there. You know, we don't want to create hurdles to people voting. I think I think the goal here is to get everybody voting and to make it easier. And I remember when we did the when we did the election centers last time. We had calls from people that were really upset with the fact that they showed up at their normal place to vote and it was closed. And they got confused as to where they were supposed to go and, you know. Well, we, I, the, let, me, let me say that the county's never done the election center thing. What we did was we put five poll books out in precincts just to see how they worked. And they worked great. No, no, we, we got some heat with a general election mm -hmm. where, or not a general election, but using the election centers where uh, I believe we got calls into our auditor's office. They were very upset because there was some confusion related to that. But that was not our election, is that correct? Mm -hmm. That was the schools or the or the city's election. You're missing the point. But we had ran? voters that were upset because they couldn't find the place they needed to vote. So now you're saying it's not our responsibility. You're right, but does the voter care? They're just getting the runaround. How many times do you have to sit on the phone and go through the, the call system and get to the end and you find out that there's nobody at the end of the line. I don't want to create problems with the election process. We just need to keep it simple. But that, that's just me. I'm just, these are really good questions. I'd like to know the answers to them. Mr. Barr. To John's point again, and John is on top of things today. Um, I, just you know, you today, at, is that what you're As saying? opposed to last week. <laughs> <laughs> as, yeah. um, 
Wake up, John. Thank you. Uh, we've gone from, you know, the idea of going from 70 to 25 polling locations. I, I like the poll books. I wish that we had 70 locations with poll books because that's where the people are going to go. And these smaller elections, we certainly have, you know, significant turnout, but it's not like a, a countywide election with 100,000 registered voters. Uh, you know, in, in other states, I've heard of people waiting seven hours in line to, to cast their ballot. I don't want them to wait more than five minutes. And I think that's how it worked out in Yankton there with, with their smaller uh, district, et cetera. I, uh, I would rather us go to keeping the same 70 precincts, putting the equipment in there for instant. Uh, uh, there is no way to vote twice uh, with this technology. Uh, and it's, it's got some wonderful uh, characteristics, but, uh, you know, trying to uh, uh, trick old people into not voting at all, you know. <clears throat> we don't want to disenfranchise people who honestly want to vote. Um, just because they moved their polling place, you know, from the mall to Wall Lake. <laughs> and uh, anyway, I have a concern about that, Bob. I, I like the idea of going to this, but I'm not ready to try it in a big, big election. Well, uh, you know, to that end, I, I did propose something to this commission a while back, and I don't know if you recall it, but uh, uh, doing exactly that is rolling it out, uh, keeping the old precincts, all 71 of them, but uh, introducing the poll books. And I think that might be a, a good fail-safe thing. Uh, the other thing is that I would tell you is that we are still dependent on those e-poll books in those precincts. Now, like Cindy pointed out, if I had to have a recount, it'd be a smaller recount. Uh, That's right. But uh, I, I, like I say, I think that would work. And if that would be a step in the right direction, why well, I would certainly uh, be willing to work very hard to facilitate that concept. Commissioner Heiberger? Even with 70, there's still the concern of connectability. Right, but you're breaking it down into some very small chunks. We've hit this connectability issue multiple times. Monty, you're here. Would you come forward? I think some of us have questions about that because the last thing we want to do is make a mess out of this. Good this morning, Commissioners. And it's becoming Wadenbach. more and more confusing as we sit here. Good morning, Commissioners. Uh, Monty Wadenbach, Minnehaha County Information Technology Director. Um, <clears throat> regarding the connectivity issues, you know, I think, um, you know, there probably would be more concern in those rural areas uh, than in town. Um, you know, and as far as the connectivity goes, my understanding with this system is they would still be able to vote, um, but if, if the system's not able to communicate up with the uh, central uh, server, um, it would have lost its ability to know if you voted more than one place. So you'd want to get that resolved as quickly as possible. Um, but I, I think there's still some question on some of those rural areas as far as the connectivity goes. Um, I think uh, I think it would be good to get out to some of those and do some, uh, some testing to make sure we have good connectivity at those locations. So have you been out to those rural areas to check connectivity? The Information Technology Department has not been out there. Okay. Um, Bob went um, on his own to do that connectivity testing and we've talked that it would be good to have um, uh, one of my technicians go to those different locations and, and do testing so we have uh, you know, good confidence that, that we have connectivity, at specifically the rural areas. Uh, Commissioner Kelly. I know Monty's got some other questions. Are we going to address them at this point or are we going to bring him back? Uh, I, I can address them now as far as, you know, uh, supporting the fleet of laptops. You know, in the, in the proposal here, you know, is a request for 100. But I've also heard numbers of potentially 150 and 200. Um, with, I have talked to my staff. I have a small staff that would be able, that, you know, is responsible for supporting uh, computers and laptops. That's a large fleet of laptops to, you know, prepare and get ready, um, depending on what, um, you know, software updates that the computer may need. Um, just going and getting all of those laptops, turning them on, uh, performing any changes or, or whatnot, putting them back into the cases, back into whatever storage they came from. It, it's man hours. Um, so I've talked to, to Bob that I, I don't have the staff to 
maintain that fleet of, of laptops without neglecting other stuff, and I just don't feel that we could do it properly. So I think that's where it's kind of looked at some outside resources, um, you know, for for the support of those. It's, it's, uh, it's work to support Windows to laptops. follow up, so basically you're saying you will not support this request. You, you would not, from IT department, support this request. Yeah, I, what I'm saying is, yeah, we don't have the proper resources to manage this additional fleet of 100 to potentially 200 laptops without neglecting other county what, requirements. What promise do we have from Windows not to roll out any updates or anything the night before a general election? Um, <laughs> valid question. Uh, so, you know, I think... Whoever they have would a be customer managing, support hotline you can call. Yeah. Your call is Whoever would be managing this fleet of laptops would have to configure those laptops so that they did not automatically get Windows updates um, because you wouldn't want those Windows updates. And for the most part, you know, they're, they're in a box sitting in storage somewhere. Right. So for every election, you know, if you decided you want to put those Windows <laughs> updates and if, if we managed the, the fleet of laptops, we would put those Windows updates as a, you know, you know, precautionary sure. measure to make sure that it's got all the proper windows on the security um, you know security we would either have to re-image those for every election or something um, there was some discussion about the laptops not having Internet Explorer on them um, and that would reduce the risk rate if you don't have users going out you know um, mm -hmm. and, and getting on the internet that reduces your security footprint right greatly um, but but I'll just restate if, if the county IT department was managing a fleet of laptops, we would want you know all the proper Windows updates you know, to be on there, and those come out every uh, uh, second Tuesday of every month. Uh, there's a new Tuesday. group of <laughs> that's Tuesday. Oh, okay. so I, Commissioner Eiberger has been patient, so go ahead. Um, with laptops, and you just said 150 to maybe 200, we have ongoing maintenance, we have ongoing replacement. These are also laptops that are going to sit in a box most of the time during the year. And you look at the expense of sitting a laptop in a box that's going to be used four or five times a year. And like I said, ongoing maintenance and replacements as they outdate and sit there, it mm -hmm. seems like kind of a yeah. waste of funds that you're spending that much money on 150 laptops that are going to sit in a box. Yeah, I mean, they are, you know, for this purpose only, and, um, um, yeah, I, I, I think that, uh, you know, the, the equipment probably wouldn't wear out, but as we all know, technology evolves. Advances. So, you know, in five years, you'd probably say, gosh, this is, you know, the old model. Um, we want the new model, whether or not it's, it's worn out is irrelevant. The new model that comes out is going to have something better. Um, Hard Intercivic's already on their, their second, you know, um, uh, device since you know, they were looking at them last year. So, uh, Commissioner Kelly, do you have a question? Well, yeah, and I don't think you can answer, but w with two hundred fifty thousand dollars worth of computers or whatever it's going to be. Um, we need a fiscal note on this, and I don't imagine you can calculate what the costs are going to be, annual costs ongoing with this thing. You, the more you talk, the more involved your department becomes with this thing. Um, I assume that it'll be significant, just the the re, well, the reprogram or whatever you do it before the election cycles, and and um, whatever else you got to do. Just today, I think it looks like all of us have had some problems with our iPads. And, <laughs> Those and, Murphy's Law. I mean, yeah. it's a good example of what, I mean, if this happened at an election, we got a real major problem because you could have three people there trying to get us straightened out on this thing. And nobody anticipated it before the meeting. So uh, I guess I'm asking, am I right in saying there's probably going to be significant costs, annual costs of maintaining this whole system? And I don't believe that comes out of HABA funds. Yeah, I think uh, Murphy's Law did come here this morning. Got everything working. Um, yeah, as far as you know, cost supporting these devices. Yeah, there definitely would be a shift of cost. I mean, if, if the IT department 
was involved with managing them or whoever's involved with managing there, there would be a shift of cost from you know um, uh, printing out you know uh, paper poll books to managing a fleet of computers um, and managing that fleet of computers ongoing and replacement cost and, and whatnot so uh, yeah the man hours would, would have to change to folks with you know technical uh, technical skills um, another concern I guess I would, would uh, point out is kind of the rollout plan you know um, if, if there's five additional counties and Minnehaha uh, that would be rolling this out at, at the next election um, I would certainly think that Hart InterCivic and the state would be extremely busy um, so when there's that area of responsibility and, and you know they talk about re-imaging them um, could be done by the state might be done jointly with the county I want more detail about what that really means might be done jointly with the county <laughs> yeah other questions other comments Commissioner well, if I can just uh, echo a little bit about what Dick was talking about you know if there's a problem at a voting center then the appropriate response would be to provide a provisional ballot to go ahead and to take that and to hold it. The concern I have, though, is that if there is a problem with the e-poll books or is there, if there is a glitch in the system, that means we're going to have to use provisional ballots. And I guess my concern right now is, you know, we don't have, we don't have the e-poll books at this point, but that's just another thing not to break and to slow down the process, and that would eliminate the need for a provisional ballot. So uh, I would like to have some of the more uh, questions that we brought up here answered um, before we, as the county commission, vote to go to one precinct. And also, as we sit as the you know canvas uh, for the Board of Elections for Minneapolis County, we also have that responsibility as well, as well as uh, our auditors. So um, the concerns that our IT have uh, related to this, I think, uh, gives us an opportunity to get some of these answers um, before I'm willing to cast a yes vote, I don't know how everybody else feels. Ken, did you have any comments? You were shaking your head a couple times. Um, <laughs> yes, most. They were answered. They were <laughs> answered. Okay, thank you. Is there a time frame on this, Bob? That needs to be. Uh, you know what? You need to come. Uh, you know, Secretary of State and the vendor both need uh, sufficient time to do this here. And then uh, I would uh, like an opportunity, maybe we defer this here, to, to try to answer Dick and, and John's questions. I thought they were pretty pertinent, and I really honestly hadn't thought about them. And I would dig you up an answer uh, for them, or whatever that is. Uh, you know, the, the other part about, uh, I'd like to address the provisional ballot thing. Yeah. The provisional ballot thing is given out when, when somebody comes up on the the, the well, they're not on the, the polling list for that precinct or they're not on there at all and that's when we give the provisional ballot out um, if there, there's no connectivity to that machine you can still vote on it and that information will be loaded onto that tablet and then later on when we figured out the problem it would go into the system so you would have real time that's that's the distinction there well I'll tell you what oh well I'm sorry I you're talking to the guy that had an eight circuit brief and my computer crashed that was a long afternoon I, I would also tell you that the tablets in front of you are tasked to do quite a bit more than these here. They're singular in purpose. They cannot go online with them. They just have the one function, which uh, really mitigates a lot of security concerns. Commissioner Iberger. What's the cost of a printed, of printing the EPO book, not the EPO books, but the books that each precinct has? Uh, you know, we have that done at IT, and my understanding was somewhere between twenty-four and twenty-five hundred dollars. Unless I, my, you're asking me to draw on my memory. Uh, oh, Commissioner. if it's twenty-four hundred dollars, and we already have to spend an extra twelve hundred dollars to print additional ballots if we go to EPO books. Mr. Chairman, Commissioner Barth, uh, I've seen these poll books in action and I I actually am impressed with how they work I just am not sure that we're ready I'd like to I'd like to uh, find out the legal consequences of uh, one precinct uh, I'd like to see if there's a way to roll them out incrementally instead of the whole county uh, at once I'd like to def make a motion to defer action till the 13th of January which I think is the second Tuesday uh, that's my motion 
I'll second. We have a motion and a second to defer. 14. Mr. Chairman, uh, he says it's the 14th. Second Tuesday is not got a date and the on 14th, it. The 14th, yes. Seventh is the first meeting, 14th. Okay, 14th. Second, second Tuesday, the 14th. Is there any other comments or questions? Well, just a comment. I think we're going to have to have a whole lot more information before anybody's, or from what I sense, at least I'm going to support this thing. I got to including the single precinct connectivity and the costs. You know, we. I don't know if it's going to cost more or less than what the present system costs, but right now to me it's it's horribly confusing, and I can't imagine how confusing it's going to be to the voters. Commissioner Becker. <clears throat> well, and I I guess the question I have is is Lincoln County at least uh, going to be included in this next rollout? And if they weren't, why were they eliminated? Good heavens, we have half the city sitting in Lincoln County. Talk about an odd lot. Well, Commissioner, they, uh, uh, Paula Fate uh, has yeah. opted not to pursue this here, and uh, uh, I don't know if her uh, pending exit would have anything to do with that or not. It's mm. a good question, though. Commissioner Barth? This is all coming from Help America Vote funds, and we need to make, make it help people vote and not in any way uh, hinder them. And I <coughs> hope would be that we find a way to uh, improve security, make it easier for people to vote, etc. And uh, right now, I think we're just not ready. Mr. Chair? Yes, sir. Uh, I can see the way this is going. I'm not going to read the rest of this here because I'll be wasting your time. But uh, I would like to, uh, uh, you know, after this is over, have the ability to contact each yeah. one of you with your questions and put them in writing so I can get answers to them. Sure. And I can't, you know, I don't know what the answer is to it. Those are very good yeah. questions that you two guys have. Something I hadn't considered. I'm not sure if the Secretary of State has, if it's come up in one of the other elections, but I could find out the answer for you. Well, I, I don't believe we need to put these in writing necessarily. That, that this was brought to the Commission to be discussed. You can't answer an awful lot of the questions. And uh, that leaves us with more questions than answers when we're leaving this argument. Well, Commissioner, if you don't put them in writing, how am I going to know how to answer? How am I going to know? Well, what I mean, it's just. Okay, never mind. We can help you with the questions. That's not an issue. Um, I think the the uh, tape will also be available if you have questions of clarity. But you know, the discussion that we've had today is important because when this thing goes out to the general public, they have to understand it. And right now, I think we're having a little difficulty understanding it specifically the single precinct issue. And then the combination of Lincoln County and Minnehaha County in the city, those are legitimate questions that need to be answered before we move ahead with this. So uh, I also like the conversation about a test site versus doing it countywide because anytime I've ever worked on an IT project, uh, it's been tested significantly in one particular location before we um, move it forward and the other thing is the connectivity which has been brought up generally on a regular basis I think that has to be part of the test site is to make sure that that test site is in a rural setting along with the possibility of an urban setting and frankly I think IT needs to be involved in the technical part of, of connectivity because I don't have that ability uh, I can read meters but that's not really what we're involved with here I just have one question maybe I'm totally wrong didn't we at one point on one election have a vote anywhere deal yeah we did and which election was that was it a city county where I I mean I it was we, a, we did this thing once it was a school district and election. the city the city for the uh, event center so I could have at the event center I could have voted at uh, IPC yeah. or I could have gone down here or wherever yep. I wanted to vote. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think uh, Bev already addressed that once. Mm -hmm. And do you want to come forward and reiterate, please? <coughs> the event center, we had to, I was superintendent for that one. We had to go to your own precinct to vote. Correct. But the 2010, uh, 2011, 2012, 2013, 
school board elections, you could vote anywhere. The 2012 election was combined with the city's commission and uh, charter amendments and all of that. That was a combined, and they could vote anywhere there as well. We're hoping to do that again in April for the mayor and all those initiatives and the uh, charter amendments as well. But there won't be any county conversations right. on that election at all. Yeah, right. Okay. I think that's the point we've all struggled with a little bit is the rural county, so to speak. And we do, we do have much of the city down below 57th Street. <clears throat> And I know in past elections, when the city has had an election, I've been superintendent at elections for many, many years, that we've had to send voters who vote in Lincoln County down to Lincoln County to vote for their Lincoln County things, mm -hmm. and they could vote in Sioux Falls for their Sioux Falls things. See, that's so that's kind of bad when you've got to send a voter to two different locations to vote. Yep. Yep, sir, sure. I always hate to get rid of a voter. You know, when you tell them, when I was at Memorial as a superintendent and told these voters <coughs> that they had to go over to the Church at the Gate or they had to go to S Discovery to vote, you never knew if they actually did that or if you lost that voter that right. day. Right. Mm -hmm. And so my thinking has always been you get them in the precinct, you find a way to let them vote. Right. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Bob, do you have any more? I, I did have one other thing, you know, and Jeff's, uh, to Jeff's, you know, conversation about uh, doing the 71 precincts with the e-poll books, and uh, that, that, that interests me a lot because I think it might be one of these uh, things where we roll it out and, uh, you know, we could minimize any problems that we have and certainly find out about them. However, due to current state law, I cannot have an e-poll book and a paper poll book at the same time. Uh, would I like to change that state law? Yes, I would. But that's one of the peculiarities. So you're fail safe of having that paper poll book to go back to in that uh, you know circumstance is simply not there. I got a feeling that may be addressed at the next legislative session also because I don't think that was too well thought through, to be honest. We would do a motion, don't we? Yes, we do have a motion and a second to defer this until a second meeting in January. And there's a debate on when that is. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the first meeting is on the 7th. I know that for sure. And then the Sorry. second one will be seven days later. <laughs> we got it on the 2nd. Uh, all those in favor, say aye. Aye. Those opposed, we'll see you second week of January. Thank you for your extensive time on this matter. Appreciate your input. <clears throat> Item number 15 is consider a motion to approve the appointments of Roger Turveen and Arthur Crines III to the Siouxland Heritage Museum Board of Directors, effective January 1st, 2014. Bill Hoskins. Bill Hoskins, Director, Siouxland Heritage Museums. Um, this would be to consider an appointment of Roger Turveen, uh, who's a uh, CPA with I. Bailey to a three-year term on the Siouxland Heritage Museum's board, as well as Arthur Krenz III. Arthur is a retired contractor, uh, general contractor in the community. Um, <clears throat> the county has four appointments on the museum board. The city actually has four as well. Uh, two uh, individuals, Tim Schendel, has completed his second three-year term as has Sandy Dean, uh, and so they cannot be reappointed for a, another term at this point. Um, and so both Arthur and Roger uh, submitted applications through the commission office for positions on the museum board. And I would recommend. I'll make a motion to approve those two appointments. Second. A motion and a second to approve uh, Mr. Trevine and Mr. Krenz. Any other comments? Those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion unanimously passes. Thank you. Thank you. Item 16 is to authorize the chairman to sign the 2014 Rural Ambulance Quality Assurance Contract between Dr. Jeff Luther and Minnehaha County. Ken McFarland. Commissioner, we have a number of contracts that we look at at year end, 
and that uh, that we bring it to you for your consideration and this is the one with the quality assurance provider for our rural ambulance service uh, this is with dr. Jeff Luther and it is the, an annual contract in the amount of thirty thousand uh, dollars for uh, 2014 this contract was at twenty eight thousand for 2013 um, I anticipate this one will be a little bit more extensive next year because I think we do need to do a review of our ambulance licenses again based on the new ordinance uh, and we reduce the time frame is when we review those licenses. Um, Dr. Luther has looked at this agreement and he, he's agreed to do the work for specified. One of the things that we've been working with him <coughs> and that for the last month is to bring in uh, a report to you about the uh, what this level of activity has been for the last uh, year mm -hmm. and that and to make sure that he and he's going through all those run reports right now to uh, to take a look at those to put together his report so um, again this is just one of many annual contracts that we have that we'll be bringing to you between now and year end uh, for, for continuation Commissioner Heiberger I just have one question. I don't remember the answer, and you kind of touched on this, but is it part of that contract that says at the end of the year before renewal that we get a report? Yes. Okay. I was just looking for a date. Thank you. Other questions? Commissioner Kelly? Correct me if I'm wrong, but we have discussed whether or not we felt we needed a uh, quality assurance director in budget, during budget times. You did. And if I remember correctly, the last time we talked about it, we didn't want to do anything then because we were having ambulance license renewals, and all of a sudden we're having ambulance license renewals again. And so I kind of get the feeling we don't want to talk about it. But, but we've gone through this issue, and then nothing happens. I guess I'm curious. Well, you have, and you've gone through this issue, and you discussed it this last time at budget time as well, and that but the end result was that you did allocate funds for 2014 specifically for this purpose and that uh, for quality assurance so yes it's an issue that you've talked about a number of times and that and whether or not it's worth having one of the things on the ambulance licensing you'll re you will recall that we did do we used to have a four-year renewal period and I believe that during the last you know when we brought on new licenses uh, particularly in the southeast quadrant of the county and that we shortened that licensing period, I believe, to two years. And that, so that's one of the reasons, you know, that and our ordinance is structured as such that the person who fills this role does, in fact, play a big role in reviewing those license applications and measuring qualifications, you know, and making recommendations for licensing issues. Is this a one year or two year contract? It's one year. We do this on an annual basis. Okay. Commissioner Peckett? Now, I understand the City of Sioux Falls is currently reviewing, I believe, applications for their ambulance licensure. I and, think so. And so if, depending on the circumstance, whoever gets that particular license for the City of Sioux Falls obviously could end up having some rural areas of Minneapolis County. So we could, at that point, depending on who gets that agreement, we may have an agreement with, let's say, one of our licensees like uh, Rural Metro, assuming they get the agreement, we don't have a problem. But if they don't, then we'd have inconsistency within our model, correct? Yeah, because right now, I mean, um, if Rural Metro, well, for whatever reason, was no longer in business right. or couldn't respond, I mean, our licensing, we would have to revisit that issue for that district uh, that Rural Metro currently serves in the rural area. Right. That, because that was a specific license to that company for that area. And so, yes, that would yeah. be an issue that we would have to revisit if we had a major change like that. And a person that could help us visit that would be someone like Correct. Jeff Luther. Commissioner Barth. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, each ambulance service in Minnehaha County has their own quality assurance uh, medical person on board. If they are not <clears throat> all uh, dependent on Dr. Luther, our dependence is on Dr. Luther. And I, I've got to say that uh, over these last seven years, We've gotten precious little information from from Dr. Luther, and I'm not going to support this. May I say one thing? Certainly. And that, again, our ordinance is structured right now that talks about 
what the duties of a yep. person of this and some of the requirements to measure the effectiveness of our ordinance. My own personal opinion, and well, I'll say it's professional opinion too, if anything this past year has taught me with the operation of things that are medically provided, the fact of having someone with the accreditation and oversight over that operation and that to help steer you through those shark infested waters, even though they may not do it a lot, it still provides you some, some safety net uh, for, for the task that we're asked to do. Yep. So. In three plus years, that might be the most politically astute comment I've ever heard. <laughs> <laughs> Commissioner? I just think that uh, potentially we could uh, use the information that each ambulance service uh, uh, gives to their own quality assurance person as, as the, what we need for our ordinance. Thank you. Commissioner Jeff? Peckis? Oh, I always, you know, and, and Jeff, I think that's value, but remember who's paying for it. Because I'm the licensing board, you're the licensing board. I'd rather hear from my guy than their guy on how great they are. So. Mr. Kelly, but Jeff, help me on this. There's been some question of reports even being filed in the past, has there not? That's that's true. In fact, uh, one ambulance uh, group said that they uh, they know that they have a requirement to turn these things over to Dr. Luther, and they've piled them up on their desk, waiting for him to call and say, "Where are they?" Waiting. One thing I might suggest to you, and that, um, and I'm glad we brought it here on the 10th. If you would like to defer this. And that until, uh, and again, we've been in communications with Dr. Luther for over a month, and that to make sure that he brings this report in to you, and that, and if you would like to wait before you consider the contract and hear Dr. Luther's report, we can certainly do that. I make a motion to defer action. Second. For till the 10th. No, we're on the 10th. We're on the 10th. Oh, <laughs> to the 17th. Of, sorry. Okay. There's a problem with dates today. <laughs> um, so your motion is to defer until next week? Yes, sir. <coughs> That's okay with a second? Yes. We have a motion and a second to defer until January 7th, uh, December. <laughs> Time travel, it's a tough thing. How are you in here? Uh, December 17th. Any comments, questions? If not, those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, nay, motion unanimously passes. Item 17 is to authorize the chairman to sign the 2014 IBC housing contract between Carroll Institute and Minnehaha County. Ken McFarland. Commissioners, this is the 2014 contract uh, between the county and Carroll Institute to house IVCs. Um, and those are folks that are awaiting an involuntary commitment to a state institution that have been part of that process. And this is in lieu of holding those folks in uh, jail and or detox and that this was a program that we instituted this past year and uh, uh, we've had some very good comments on that about this. In fact, I had a, a, one of the attorneys that handles the IVCs on a regular basis just came up to me and, and told me how pleased he was at how this process has been working, how much better it was for his clientele and how helpful the folks at Carroll Institute have been with this program. As you know, we uh, discuss this at budget time and that uh, the contract amount in 2013 was $216,175 and we're going to be looking at 222660 dollars for 2014, so just a modest increase and in that to push that program uh, through the whole year. And so this is a one-year contract from January 1 to December 31st, 2014. Thank and it's kid. in a separate line item in the budget. This is not in the commission office budget anymore. Thank you, Ken. Any questions? Is there a motion? Motion to approve. Second. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve the contract with Carroll Institute. Those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion unanimously passes. Item 18 is to authorize the chairman to sign the 2014 animal control contract between the Sioux Falls Humane Society and Minnehaha County. Ken McFarland. 
This is the 2014 contract with the Humane Society. Uh, it's, as you know, the 2014 budget contains an allocation of $47,000, which was the same allocation in 2013 uh, to provide animal control services. A part of this contract of that $47,000 is used that we pay them a flat monthly rate for their services that covers primarily the daytime hours, but the balance of that contract and that uh, covering the uh, we pay extra for off hours and that when they have to respond uh, after five or on weekends or on an emergency basis and that and so um, all other provisions are the contract are the same as what it was in 2013 even the dollar amounts and that and we would recommend your approval any questions of Ken make the motion second the motion and a second to approve the contract with the Humane Society those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. Motion unanimously passes. Item 19 is to authorize the chairman to sign the 2014 Minnehaha County Regional Detention Center per diem contracts between Minnehaha County and partner counties. Ken McFarland. Commissioners, as you know, we are winding down on our 20-year commitment with our partner counties and that for the Regional Juvenile Detention Center, and we obviously we've got a lot of issues that we're working with them in order to go out and perhaps renew that. But this is the renewal, this is the actual per diem agreements with those partner counties uh, for when they actually use the center. And we have been on a track for the last few years in anticipation of, um, you know, uh, rolling out our new system if we get to that point of just simply increasing the per diem rate for secure detention by five dollars a day particularly since we've been in this flux with our population numbers due to JDAI. So this agreement reflects raising our uh, secure detention um, per diem cost for our partner counties from 150 to 155 dollars per day and then the um, <clears throat> non-secure or shelter care detention that happens out at VOA, that's being ranged from 110 to 115 dollars per day, so another five bucks a day. And that um, this was an item that we were going to discuss last week during our regional advisory board with our counties, and that and to prep them for this. Unfortunately, we got delayed by a snowstorm that happened on that particular day. So we are recommending that we get the per diem agreements out as soon as we can to our partner counties because uh, we do have um, in our joint cooperative agreements and other contracts, we just we have to have these back in order to maintain their place in the partnership by December 31st. So we just need to get, we couldn't afford to wait, you know, to reschedule that meeting. Thank you. Commissioner Barth. I plan to support it, but uh, Ken, are we, uh is Minnehaha County subsidizing the uh, the partners in this, or, or is this actually the cost? No, this is not us? actually the cost. But I would add, I would also ask you to remember two things. Number one, our partner counties also pay an annual debt service fee that they pay at the beginning right. of the year, mm -hmm. and that uh, uh, for the cost that you know if you're a non-member county, you're not doing that. You're just paying on a per day. The other thing that, quote, makes the actual cost somewhat difficult to predict, and it's something from our own doing, is simply because you know, there are standardized fixed costs for that facility, but our population numbers have fluctuated so much due to JDAI, and that's one of the reasons we're trying to uh, get that um, you know, narrowed down and stabilized on what that population is, and that's so that we can better allocate secure dollars to not secure uh, resources and so that complicates the situation but that's of our own doing as well simply because of our numbers have dropped so far and when you just simply take a look at less kids in a fixed cost facility that that cost does in fact go up but again since we're so close to the end of the partnership and that in these counties have been on board for 18 years this was the reason that we uh, we've adopted this was philosophy of the five dollar increase until we get to the end of the agreement and then we'll do new agreements so make a motion to uh, approve the per diem contract second we have a motion and a second to approve the regional detention center contracts those in favor say aye, aye. aye. those opposed nay motion unanimously passes 
next item is Minnehaha County Commissioner Liaison Reports. Any liaison reports this morning? If not, any new business? Do you know if you have something? Yeah. Shannon, did you have something? Old business? Uh, under new business, Sarah, thank you for being here this morning. And especially for two hours in your condition, I think you ought to get a uh, medal for that. Uh, any old business? Commissioner Shannon Schultz, me at County Highway Department, Senior Project Engineer. Uh, you have heard me talk about the pavement management system that RFP is still being worked on on the contract. The reason for the most recent delay is Monty uh, requested that we pursue uh, the idea of having those services provided on the consultants or the vendors' websites or servers. We ran the gamut of those options, came up with costs, and uh, it was decided to not pursue that. So the original proposal to host it in-house has been decided upon and approved by Monty as well as DJ Boothy, Highway Superintendent. And so the final contract will be drafted today or tomorrow. Monty will review. The DOT through CCOG will then review. And then the consultant will review. And hopefully, I'm, I'm hopeful that by the end of the year, we will have a signed and executed contract, and then we can actually name who that vendor is. Commissioner Iberger. Some concerns with that were um, the storage of all the information right. from the pavement management system going on the IT. Um, when I talked to DJ yesterday, I suggested that there's a memorandum of understanding between the highway department and the IT department that in the future when their space runs out in the IT department because of the amount of um, pavement management system that's going to go on it, that highway will be responsible for those costs. And that was their agreement to sign this contract. But I said I think there needs to be a memorandum of understanding going forward just because if Monty's not here or if DJ's not here, I want it to be going forward that somebody's responsible for those costs and it's not IT. So that will be coming forward too. Thank you. Commissioner Beckus? Well, because this is a pavement management system and it's based to help support highway, isn't it possible that we could use highway funds for this? That's, that's what we're talking about. That's why there's going to be a memorandum of understanding. Okay. Thank you for revisiting that, by the way. Mm -hmm. It uh, was a dramatic difference in cost from what I understand. So there will be a request for your execution or sign signature to execute the contract. I probably won't make it by Thursday uh, at noon, but the following Thursday deadline I will make. So that would be a week from next Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> Good one. No date and time. Any other questions for Shannon? If not, I need a motion to go into exec session for personnel and legal briefing. So moved. Second. Motion and a second uh, to go into exec session for personnel and legal. Uh, we'll be back here in five minutes. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion unanimously passes.